I'm getting ready to present at NASDAQ on Wall Street. It's like a big deal for me. And I get a call that morning from my mother-in-law and she informs me that my wife is being rushed to the hospital and that I should probably get home. As I'm getting on the plane, I realize that a ruptured ectopic pregnancy in most cases leads to death. And I couldn't believe that this was happening to me. I spent the next five days in the hospital with her. And every night I went to bed, the only thing I could think about, it was just to hope that she would make it through one more night. And naturally I, I started asking myself a lot of questions. What makes me fulfilled? What makes me happy? And I'm really trying to sort through like, have I been a good father to my kids? Have I been a good husband? I felt a ton of guilt because I had realized that really I hadn't. I realized the work I was doing was not fulfilling. And I had a, I had a wake up call. The great part of this story is that my wife fought through this and today is very healthy. Uh, this was one of those moments in life where it, it forced me to change. And, and this I think is really what my cosmic bridge is. Today we have on the show Tyler Hall, who was the CEO and founder of Drivably, a company he successfully sold and is going to be talking about the ups and downs, but he's also going to be talking about a very extreme health scare that he had in his family. And then he's going to move on to his work today, which is working with some of the top CEOs and founders as a coach. Looking forward to the show. Tyler, let's get into it. Very excited for uh, today's show. Obviously, you've been a successful entrepreneur in the past. You're now coaching other uh, entrepreneurs who are in a fast-paced environment. I was wondering if you could share your entrepreneurship journey and some of the challenges that you face, because I know entrepreneurship is often very glamorized, but as you know, having been through it, and as I know, um, it's very glamorized, but there's some very big mountains you, you have to overcome. So it'd be great to hear about some of those from you. Yeah, happy to do it. It's uh, There's not a shortage of them. They're sort of endless I'm going to share the two or three minute version of the origin story, which is that when I was in college, I paid for school by flipping cars, by buying and selling cars. And I got really good at doing that. And this experience, first of all, there was tons of learnings just by doing that, right? Just by sort of hustling to, to get by and make sure that I had the finances that I need to finish school and then ultimately launch a business. So what I did was I took those learnings. I had some sort of conviction around the automotive space. Um, instead of going and building a tech company straight away, I, I got some great advice from a couple of mentors, which was, hey, go join an early stage startup and figure this stuff out inside the walls. And so I learned this thing in college. I then went and sort of got my MBA by uh, working with two early stage tech companies, both that, you know, fortunately for me, were very successful. Um, in between those times, right, I tried to launch a couple of things and businesses and side hustles and had some epic failures. And ultimately, those were the things that helped me sort of learn and prepare to launch Drivably. So eventually, January of 2018, instead of building tech right out of the gate, I started a car dealership from the ground up. Uh, car dealers were ultimately going to be my end customer for the business that I wanted to build and the problem I wanted to solve. And so instead of going and partnering with a car dealer, I said, I'm just going to be my own car dealer. I'm going to really learn what it's like to be my customer. Believe it or not, Michael, that was the hardest part of the entire journey. But I knew if I wanted to build the best technology that would support car dealerships, this is what I had to do. So, so I built Auto Hall. We did that for one year. And we gained some real conviction around one specific problem. And so um, January of 2019, we went out, we raised some venture capital uh, to, to, to maybe start out with what were some of the challenges. As a first-time founder, raising venture funding is like next to impossible. You know, I sat down, I had 55 conversations with investors before I got my first yes. And by the way, I had no money. I had taken some initial seed funding from an angel investor. And I had blown all that money very irresponsibly. And that moment, I was literally weeks away. I don't even think our investors knew this, that we're writing this check. I was weeks away from being fully out of money. And before we even basically started being done. And so 
you know, to sort of start out with some of the challenges, raising money as a first time founder was certainly one of those things that was uh, felt like felt like it was impossible. So. So you said you had 55 different conversations with investors, you're a few weeks from running out of money. How did you find the strength and motivation to, to keep going in that situation? I think I um, one of the things that a lot of founders have and, and that I certainly had was just like, I think I was too too dumb or too naive to even realize like how big of an issue I had up in front of me. And, and I think we also have like, in that same vein, we are like so optimistic that everything's just going to work out that like seemingly giant problems don't seem like that big of an issue. And this was one of them, right? Like <clears throat> I look back, I was calm, cool, collected. Nobody on the team even realized like we were out of money. <laughs> and, and it was just like, yeah, we got this investment and everything worked. But man, like if they wouldn't have said yes, uh, I'm, uh, I wouldn't be sitting here with you today. So you, you get the money, right? The investor said yes. And then I know that a lot of problems come after that when you actually have the money. So what, what, what happened after that? This was definitely like the first time in the company where I was like, oh shit. Um, like things got really real, right? Like with the previous angel funding, some of that was my capital. Some of it was a partner of mine. Um, that was like less stressful for, for some reason. I think it's because we trusted each other and it was like, you know, if this whole thing goes down, we're going down together kind of thing. Once you take outside funding, institutional capital, the game really changes and the pressure is really on, right? And now you're being asked for uh, numbers and reporting and, and everything else. We ended up, after we got that first term sheet, we closed on um, another around another million dollars. And nine months in, I had basically blown through all of our cash and, and I had almost nothing to show for it. And so we were fortunate enough to get scrappy. Uh, we raised a little bit more money. And I think our investors, they really trusted us. And I was super grateful for them for doubling down. I think they knew we had learned some really hard lessons, right? Um, some really, really hard lessons. Basically, after nine months, we scrapped the entire engineering team. We started over with a with a nearshore team here in the U.S., uh, an outsourced development team. In about three months, we had a product that was working and functional that we could sell. Uh, we took it to market. We started having great success, uh, and then COVID happened, and uh, everything changed. So, how did how did COVID affect the business? Um, well, initially it was very unclear how long COVID was going to last. Okay. So, um, the automotive space had a bunch of analysts that were predicting this could be like a three to five year run of like all time lows, all time, low supply, all time, low demand, all time, low car sales. Um, and most dealers in most states were not considered essential businesses. And so for a few weeks, it felt like an eternity. It was a very dark and depressing time for me. It was really only two or three weeks uh, that, the, that the automotive sector shut down. But that was enough time for basically all of our paying customers to cancel. And so we had started to make some good traction. We were doing about 30K of, of monthly recurring revenue. Um, and I think we were burning at this time maybe 70 and all of our customers canceled. We basically went to zero in revenue in a period of about two weeks. And so again, we had to make some really hard decisions. Uh, we had to reduce the size of our staff by um, 12 people, which was, by the way, 70% of our staff, right? Um, and we had to just get really lean and figure out how to survive. And all I could do at this point was hope that things would change and turn for the better faster than these analysts were predicting. So ultimately, those who saw what happened with the auto market, which I think a lot of people did, coming out of COVID, we had this all-time high demand for cars. We had an all-time low supply for inventory. We went out right in the middle of COVID, right at the same time, we acquired a company based in Canada. Um, we integrated the two companies and we happened to fall right in the middle of that perfect storm. 
And so we went from dead in the water, Michael, to explosive growth over the next 12 to 18 months. And that takes us now into 2021. And in 2021, the outlook was, uh, was a lot different than it was just a year earlier. And just because, as you said, you were like dead in the water in your words and then everything uh, kind of started going really well and the, the tide turned. When everything was dead in the water, did you ever have moments where you thought about like throwing in the towel? Or Yeah, every night waking up it literally in cold sweats and having and having panic attacks and um and then also like getting covid at the same time like early on in covid i mean i was not only was i ready to throw on the towel i was like i was having thoughts of like that were way worse than that right like my my brain I think the combination of COVID and what was happening in the business and my normal life, I got very depressed, right? And it was um, it was a very difficult time. I remember, I remember going to my wife and saying, um, you know, hey, you, you know how I've convinced you to just like put up with my bullshit for the last three years, um, because. I was confident we were going to have some sort of outcome with this thing. I basically told her it's highly unlikely that that that's going to happen. Um, And I remember my wife saying, basically, so what? Like, that doesn't change anything. That doesn't change the way I feel about you. It doesn't change the way the kids feel about you. Um, and, And that, for me, actually relieved a lot of the stress and the pain and the anxiety because I said, look, now I have nothing to lose. The, the people I care about the most are not going to think of me any differently. And so now let's just, let's just figure out how to get through this. And uh, Porsche ended up coming in and investing at this time. That, that gave us a, a nice boost that we needed to kind of poke our heads out of the weeds and see the world a bit more clearly. And then the tide turned from a macro standpoint with COVID. And um, yeah, things things went up fast from there so so is that like unconditional love and support from your wife and kids you realize that that was the the only real stuff that you really obviously didn't want to lose and once you knew you had that despite anything that happened in the company it, it gave you that confidence to, to keep going yeah 100 percent. you know i i would get asked the question a lot like do you feel like you're at a disadvantage being married right? Like, you know, you have these founders that are, that are single that can seemingly work around the clock and they have no sort of family obligations and things like this. And my outlook was always very different. My outlook was that I actually had a competitive advantage being married because I had somebody who I could go home to day after day that regardless of how good or bad that day was, was going to be there to be supportive. And so you know, I knew she was supportive. I didn't realize she was she was that supportive. I had this fear that if I failed, I would be failing my wife and failing my kids. And when she basically took that fear away, like everything changed. My confidence changed. My ability to operate changed. I wasn't paralyzed anymore. And so, yeah, you're you're exactly right. <clears throat> yeah, and I I totally agree with you. And I think you know the most successful founders who are also grounded and have a good balance the cosmic bridge will come on to uh yeah. are the ones often that have a strong family support because they know that's the the foundation of of what they're doing and obviously you know the the topic and the theme of this podcast is the cosmic bridge which is you know in your case on the material side you're running this this business that's having its ups and downs but eventually led to to an acquisition and was successful but what were some of the things that were going on in the background like what was that cosmic bridge for you that kept you going in these hard times yeah i mean i think it was um i think it was really that right and and i think something to note is that even though my wife and and my kids for that matter were super supportive the entire time i didn't reciprocate their that level of support in my family in them and so this thing that i realized was that 
we had a company that through some good fortune and luck and just stick to itiveness ended up being very successful. But like at the detriment of my family relationships, not being in a very good place. Right. And I tricked myself into saying, you know what? No, things with my wife are great. She loves me. She's supportive. But like, I really wasn't putting in the effort to build a deep and strong bond with her. Um, and for that matter, with my kids. And so <clears throat> to, put a, to put a bow on the drivably story, we have this explosive growth. We're going into 2021. We've got, we're basically profitable and growing like 20 to 30% a month. And we have a series A uh, soft circle. We're going to raise $20 million. And at the same time, <clears throat> we had several companies start courting us uh, to acquire the entire business and met with the board, met with my co-founder. And we decided that that was the thing that we were going to do. We we're going to pursue an acquisition. And so we ran a pretty tight process. Uh, we ended up having three term sheets in a period of about four months. This takes us into summer of 21. Uh, and then we ended up closing on a transaction with a public company who's probably the darling of the automotive tech space of the last decade called ACB Auctions. And we closed that transaction in October. And so, you know, here I am 18 months earlier, dead in the water. We have this, we have a bit of good fortune and luck. Uh, we make it through, we have explosive growth and then we're acquired. We have a great outcome. Life is good, Michael. I'm like, at the peak of the mountain, right? I'm, I'm young. I've got a great family. We just had this exit. Like, you know, I feel untouchable at this point. And five months after the acquisition, uh, I'm sitting in New York City. I'm getting ready to uh, present with the CEO of the company and a couple of execs um, at NASDAQ on Wall Street. It's like a big deal for me. And I get a call that morning from my mother-in-law and she informs me that my wife is being rushed to the hospital in an ambulance and that I should probably get home. So I text my assistant, <clears throat> say, hey, I'm not sure what's going on. I need to get a flight home immediately. Um, I get to the airport. I'm getting these text updates from my father-in-law. And, you know, generally in life, when really bad things happen, you expect that they'll just get better right? Things will just start to get better when you hit rock bottom. Uh, in this case, it was, it was the opposite. Uh, the text updates that I was getting were getting progressively worse. So I get to the airport and the updates are, we got to the hospital, we're in triage. She's having a hard time maintaining consciousness. Um, They just did a, an ultrasound. She's got two liters of blood in her abdomen. It's about 40% of the blood in the body. Um, they're, then the next update is they're rushing her in for an emergency surgery. This is about the time I'm boarding the plane. Uh, he sends me an image of what the doctor wrote on the whiteboard, which is called a ruptured ectopic pregnancy. So she was pregnant with our fourth and essentially the baby wasn't growing in the right place and burst inside of her fallopian tube and um, she started bleeding out. And so I'm getting these updates as I'm getting on the plane. I realized that a ruptured ectopic pregnancy in most cases leads to death. And I couldn't believe that this was happening to me. Right. I felt like I'm I'm how how can this be happening? We have this perfect life, this perfect family. Um it, it was like a movie. I couldn't believe it was happening to me. The next update is still in surgery. An hour later, still in surgery. An hour later, still in surgery. Uh the next one, as I'm getting ready to land the plane, was The doctor came out and talked to me and informed me that she has a very low chance of living. 
uh, it's not looking good, basically brace yourself. And this is coming from my father-in-law, her dad, right? And that was one of the hardest things for me was that I'm getting these updates from him. Like he is there experiencing this with his daughter and I'm not. I land the plane. I run outside to my Uber as fast as I can. At this point, I'm hoping I have the opportunity to just like kiss her goodbye, right? And so I tell the driver, please drive as fast as you possibly can. And I said, I know you've probably heard that before, but like, please. I, I, and uh, we get to the hospital. I run through the doors, through security, past the admin desk. Um, they're asking me to check in. I, it's kind of like you see in a movie. I'm just like, no, I got to go. I get on the elevator. I go up two floors. And I get out and I walk in the room. And there she is. And she's still, at this point, alive. She has a heartbeat. But it's not, was not a great sight to see. And so I spent the next five days in the hospital with her. And every night I went to bed, the only thing I could think about was, it was just to hope that she would make it through one more night. And naturally, because of the state that she was in, I had to, I started asking myself a lot of questions, right? What makes me fulfilled? What makes me happy? What does fulfillment even mean? What does happiness even mean? I'm asking deep questions. And I'm really trying to sort through, like, have I been a good father to my kids? Have I been a good husband? What could I have done better? I felt a ton of guilt because I had realized that it really I hadn't, right? I hadn't been a great job, a great steward of my family, and I haven't built deep relationships. I realized the work I was doing was not fulfilling, wasn't what I wanted to be doing. Um, and I had a I had a wake up call, and unfortunately, the wake up call, the change that I had to make in my life, came as a result of something catastrophic happening. Now, the great part of this story is that my wife fought through this, and she made it, and today is very healthy. But it, this was a uh, this was one of those moments in life where. It, it forced me to change. And, and this, I think, is really what my cosmic bridge is. And we'll talk about sort of how some of that deep reflection led me to what I'm doing today. Yeah, absolutely an incredible story and an amazing cosmic bridge. And it's something that comes up a lot on this podcast, which is like finding light in the darkness. And obviously, you went through a very dark moment and you came through that, reassessed your, your life, your values, different questions. Uh, one of the things that I, I wanted to come on to, because you just mentioned this, was like, what is fulfillment? What is happiness? And going on to what you're doing today with, with coaching, I saw something on your website, which I really like, which is fulfillment over happiness. And I think some people wouldn't really understand the distinction there, because I see that a lot with people saying, oh, I just want people to be happy. But I feel like that's a bit of a naive explanation. I always think of music, like incredible music that gets your spine tingling. It's not just happy. It's kind of happy, sad. It's got all these emotions at the same time. But I was wondering if you could explain how you would define fulfillment versus happiness. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I don't know that I have it all figured out yet. but and I, and I also think by definition of the word fulfillment, I don't think it is how most people think about fulfillment. It's one of those words that I think has different meanings to different people, right? So the way that I think about fulfillment is <clears throat> being fully filled, okay? Clever, right? But the idea is like fully filled with what? Like what are the things in life that provide fullness inside? of us, inside of our hearts, inside of our minds. Happiness happens to be one of those, right? I think it's a component of the pie of fulfillment, being fully filled. Um, but I also think that trial and sadness and grief is 
part of it as well, right? Without those things, I don't think you can achieve fulfillment. Um, things like joy, things like love and connection and health. I think these are things that if you can optimize for them at the highest level, you're never going to be perfect at any of them. But if you can do these things at 80%, I think that's how you achieve fulfillment. The way you deal with grief, right? The way you deal with uh, hard times. I think these all contribute to that. And so um, I think balance is like sort of the key, right? To being fulfilled is, is how, do you, how do you keep all of these different things that are an important component to fulfillment at bay and don't let any of them slide too far. Um, and I think if you can do that, that's how you can experience that. And by the way, today I feel fulfilled, but I'm still like, I'm still trying, right? I'm not, uh, I'm not pro proclaiming to be like this, yeah. the most fulfilled person in the world. So. Yeah. As you said, we, we never figure out these things a hundred percent as part of the, the beauty of life. And even like that, that question what's the cosmic bridge what's the right balance it's something you'll you'll go to your grave uh thinking about i, I wanted to come back to so the the moment you, you know your wife pulled through you reassessed your life tell me about the journey from then up until now how did you decide to make this transition into what you're doing at the moment yeah i mean the the story itself is a bit a bit um sort of unbelievable i guess there was a specific moment that i'll build to here but you know, at this time, after I had exited drivably, I'm still at the parent company. Um, I make the decision to leave the parent company, which was one of the hardest decisions I've ever made in, in my life. I, I love those people. I love the CEO of the company that acquired us. I, I had like real reason to stay, right, financially and, and otherwise. Um, we were building something amazing. The company's still thriving at the parent company, which I'm really proud of. But I knew that I wasn't going to achieve fulfillment and purpose by staying there. Um, and I, I felt sort of obligated to make sure that my wife was going to be okay, right? And so, so I left the parent company. <clears throat> this was May of last year. Um, two months later, I'm in Jackson Hole over the 4th of July holiday uh, at my parents' house. And I decide I'm going to drive up as high as I can into the mountains to find some solace and some peace and do some deep reflection. Um, at this time, by the way, I'm now advising a venture capital fund um, and I'm getting close to lots of companies. And it was the thing that in my professional life I enjoyed the most was spending time with founders and helping them navigate the impossible task of like building a good company and, and all the things required. Uh, I had been asked that day, that morning, before I drove up into the mountains by one of these founders of a company that I was actually an advisor to, uh, to coach him professionally. And my initial response was that uh, I'm not a coach. It's not what I do, but I have a coach. I have a CEO coach. And I'd love to introduce you, right? And I'll introduce you to a couple that I was recommended. Uh, this individual persisted. He said, nope, uh, it's going to be you. Um, and I said, I said let, let me think about this, right? So right after that call, I, I get in my parents' Jeep. It's a gladiator, so it has a bed, right? It's a truck, a Jeep truck. And I drive up as high as I can in Jackson Hole, the highest point of the mountain. And I'm sitting in the back of the truck and I'm basically asking God or the universe or, you know, for me, it's God. What do I do? What do I do here with my life? And I specifically asked, should I coach said individual? And I'm just sitting there pondering and I hear this wrestling behind me in the trees. And I slowly turn around and I see this mother moose that's probably a thousand pounds and nine feet tall and she's with her baby fawn it's a little baby moose and they look at me and I look at them and I know enough about moose to to know that like 
They could absolutely kill me if they wanted to, even in the back of a truck, right? But I'm calm. And the moose is making me feel calm. And it walks right up to the truck. And we get face to face. I actually have a video and pictures of this. It'd be fun to, I'll share it with you. And comes over and kind of sniffs me and walks to the edge of the mountain and strikes a pose. And I get some really good photos. And then they head down the mountain and they're gone. And that was it. And that to me was like an answer. It was like, okay, I just asked a very specific question. You know, I'm searching deep within my soul for what I should do next. And I was sent this response that was very powerful. Um, <clears throat> so I drive back home and I call the CEO and I say, hey, I'll do it. Let's do it for a month. And let's just see how it goes, right? Meanwhile, I'd reached out to Matt Mochari, who's a 20 plus year CEO coach in Silicon Valley. It's, he's coached some of the greatest unicorn founders of, of all time. And I said, hey, I'd your framework is what I used as an operator being a CEO. And I'd love to use your framework in my coaching. And he blessed it. And so I had sort of an instant like coaching framework. I didn't have to build everything from scratch. And the next month of my life was life-changing. It was life-changing to see the impact that you could have on somebody through this sort of coaching. And it was, it was life-changing to me and, and sort of filled a very specific gap in my career that I hadn't felt before, that, that had never been filled before. And so I doubled down and I said, okay, I'm going to take on a, a couple of more CEOs and we're going to see how this goes. And now I'm six or so months in uh, and it's, it's the best work I've done in my career so far. And do you think that's to do with the impact you're having on the people you're working with and seeing their reactions, the change in, the, in them? Yeah, 100%. Amazing. And then I, I also saw on your website, um, I can't remember the exact language now, but something around confronting your fears, I think is like one of the values of your framework. So I was wondering if you could talk about that. Yeah, there's a framework that's called Fear Gives Bad Advice. <clears throat> okay, and so the it's actually... It's actually fear and anger give bad advice, but I like to sort of separate them. And so fear gives bad advice. What that's about is the, the root of all bad decisions that a CEO makes or anybody in a company makes stems from a place of fear. Okay, so what happens is if you have to make a hard decision, for example, you have to let's say you've got investors and you just had a bad quarter and you have to announce to investors that you had a bad quarter and that your CTO left the company and that your biggest customer canceled, right? Your fear is that if I tell them the truth, then they're going to hate me. They're going to they're gonna slander my name. They're not going to make any more introductions to VCs. They're going to try to pull out of the investment. If this fails, are they going to sue me, right? You, you have all these irrational fears and, and, and founders get plagued by these things. The reality is if you just face the fear and do the opposite of the thing you think you should do, in this case, be 100% forthcoming with your investors, tell them everything. 100% of the time, it turns out better than if you, than if you don't, right? So the whole idea here is CEOs really, they get plagued with fear. And a lot of times they don't realize it. A great coach can say, I'm, I'm hearing you. It sounds like you're operating from a place of fear. I'm not feeling that same fear because I'm not in your shoes, right? I'm not experiencing this. But now I can help you identify the fear and then make the opposite decision of what you think you should do, which is in 100% of cases, the right decision, right? And so without having that sort of mental framework and then somebody to hold you accountable to make these sort of decisions, it's, it's really hard to do. And it's a lot of times the reasons why companies fail or succeed are these big, you know, mm -hmm. fear-based decisions. Yeah, taking this out of the context of business for a minute as well, I think 
you know, facing your fears and identifying what they are is, is useful for anyone, right? So say someone's listening to this podcast, I think one of the the first things is identifying what your fears are. So how, I guess when you're working with your clients, how do you how do you help them identify what the fears are in the first place? Yeah, that's a that's a really good question. Um, a lot of times in the context of coaching, it's, you know, if you think about like personal life and you say, what are you scared of? What are you fearful of? People usually have like two or three things. I don't like spiders. I don't like clowns and I don't like whatever, right? Like those are mine, by the way, like clowns <laughs> and snakes and scary stuff, right? Um but in the context of business, it's different, right? It's, you can't identify, it's much harder to identify things that we're fearful of, okay? Um, the only way to do it is as you're sort of talking about, in, in every single call, every week, we talk about the top goal. So the number one thing that you're trying to solve, your biggest problem Okay, that you're facing as a company. Um, and, and typically, I'm looking for through those two things, what is the thread that we need to pull on? And what are the decisions that need to be made to achieve the top goal and solve the biggest problem? Right? And almost every time we get to a point where the CEO is stuck on making the decision, or I'll say, great, you understand the decision that needs to be made. Have you made it? And they say no. And the question is, well, why not? And when you pull on that thread, you, you ultimately realize that most of the time it's because there's a fear that there's going to be some negative adverse result of making this decision, right? So it's, it's often tricky. Um, by the way, I didn't realize as a CEO, I was operating in fear until I <laughs> engaged my coach. And he was able to help me like sort of see these things. It's, it's often not like obvious when we're in that state, but the best way to understand if you're operating from a place of fear is to actually just have a co-founder or a spouse or a friend or a coach even inform you when they believe you're operating from a, a place of fear. So you can sort of stay in check. Um, and that's how, that's how I encourage, you know, the CEOs that I work with to do that. And once you've identified those fears, so you've got awareness of what they are, what's the next step? How do, how do you confront them normally? What do, what do you advise your clients? Yeah, so literally it's, it's that, it's the exercise of, okay, I, I feel like you're operating from a place of fear. You know, again, another example would be, I need to fire a key exec or I need to get my co-founder out, right? This is like one of the hardest things ever for founders. My fear is, and, and they'll typically say something like, how do, I, how do I get my co-founder out of the business? I don't think I should do it. I think I should just write it out. We're going to make it work. But it's like very clear that they need to go, right? And so their fear is, if I fire my co-founder, I get rid of them. They're going to slander my name. They're going to tweet about it. They're going to come back and sue me, right? There's all these things. And for me to be able to go, great, you're clearly operating from a place of fear. You know the right decision is to let this person go. And if you just do it, if you just do the thing, the opposite of what you thought you should do, which was leave, keep them there, so it's get rid of them. Uh, in a hundred percent of cases, it works out, right? And and they don't slander your name, and they don't sue you, and these things don't happen. And ultimately, it tends to be better for the person you're impacting. You got them out. Now they can go. There a lot of times, breath of fresh air, and I can go focus on the things that I'm great at. But also, it's great for you, and it's great for the business, right? So hopefully, that yeah. helps. Yeah, hundred percent. Something I, I, it's very related to what you were talking about with fears and, and honesty. Um, I, I saw another value you have is radical transparency, which isn't a, a phrase I'd, I'd heard before. So I was wondering if you could uh, tell us a bit more about that. Yeah, there's this framework that's, uh, that's called wear no masks. Okay. And so when, when you're the founder or CEO of a company, you sit in like the center of this 
wheel, right? And you have around the wheel, you have all these constituents. To name a few, right? Investors, advisors, your co-founder, your spouse, the employees in your company, your customers, your partners, the public, I, right? You have all these people and you're right in the center. And that's extremely, it's extremely taxing without the masks. When you have a, when you have the masks on, you have a mask that you put on to interface with any of these different people. So, oh, I'm about to go pitch a VC. I'm going to put this pitch mask on and I'm going to pretend that everything's amazing, right? Oh, I'm going to go talk to my company. Boom. I put this mask on and I'm always optimistic and I'm always happy and I have no flaws. Oh, I'm going to talk to my wife and I'm going to throw up on her about all the shit that happened today and how horrible it is. And she's going to have to bear that burden. When you realize that these masks don't need to exist at all, and I don't even mean like versions of these masks to like bend the truth. I mean, like at all. And you're just 100% radically transparent with everybody you interface with. It's incredibly freeing. And it actually ends up deepening the relationships that you have with these constituents. Now, the hardest part about doing this is you have to realize probably half the people you thought you had relationships with, they will dismiss themselves from your life because they don't want the real version of you. They want the mask version, right? They want the guy who was, who was faking it, unfortunately. But the ones that stay, the other half, those relationships will go infinitely deep. And by the way, it, they will also reciprocate and they'll now be radically transparent. And there will be no sort of barriers. You'll have employees leave because of this. Oh, I didn't realize my CEO suffered from anxiety and depression. I don't like that. I feel like that leader's unstable. But the ones who stay, they'll go, now I know I can be open about my insecurities and my vulnerabilities, right? And, and deep relationships equate to better business outcomes 100% of the time. So you might lose some people in the process, but you're going to deepen the relationships that you, that with people that stay around. Yep. Nice. One last question for you. Uh, what advice would you give to like a young person who's thinking about starting their own company, given, you know, everything you, you've been through over the last decade? My, my advice is uh, quite the opposite of what most people expect, which is to not do it. <laughs> my advice in, in, uh, is is to is to inform you okay of all of the hard things about running and building and scaling a company it's hard to maintain relationships you don't have any time you're going to be broke I, I could i could the list is endless okay but if you understand the risks and you still say i get it and I'm still willing to go and do this, you're the type of founder that should go and build a company. If you hear any of those things and you pause or you, or you cringe a little bit, don't build a company, right? Building companies are only for those who are willing to jump on the roller coaster, this thing every single day. and and stick it out, right? But it's not for everybody. Uh, it's only for the select few. So that's my advice. That is, that is great advice to, to end on. Um, we're going to put a link to your LinkedIn, to your website, uh, anywhere else that you wanted to, to send anyone listening? No, I think that's great. Thanks for having me, Michael. Awesome. No, I really enjoyed the chat, Tyler. Thanks a lot. Wow, what an incredible and inspiring story there from Tyler. Obviously a very scary incident he had with his wife. It made him reassess his whole career. And I also liked the moment he had in nature asking the universe what should be the next step and bringing him to what he's doing today, which is giving him not just happiness, as he said, but also fulfillment. If you think there's any other entrepreneurs or anyone that could benefit from listening to this podcast, please share it with them. And please subscribe to us across podcast platforms and also on YouTube and see you next week.